take it away. Okay, thanks, Phil. Um, I'm pleased to uh, introduce to you today Ivan Holloway. He's uh, Ivan is a Bur is a native of Birmingham, and is a 1981 graduate of Arthur Harold Parker High School, where he was a member of Phi Alpha. He holds an undergraduate degree from Alabama A&M University in urban planning, a master's degree from Alabama A&M University in urban and regional planning, concentrating in community development. He's the fifth son of five siblings from the union of the late Lloyd Holloway and the late Gertrude Brunette Hall Jackson Holloway. He's married to Deborah Stoves, a high school media specialist with the Birmingham Board of Education at Ramsey High School. He and Deborah have two, tw two sons, Ivan Travis and Evan Lloyd. Holloway is a lifelong member of the historic 16th Street Baptist Church, where he serves as deacon and treasurer. He has served on numerous boards and committees and is a member of uh, Omega Sci-Fi Fraternity. Prior to joining Urban Impact, uh, Holloway served as executive director at A Step Forward Inc. in Baltimore, Maryland, a community-based organization that provides substance abuse treatment and mental health services to low-income individuals and community development services in the surrounding Harlem Park neighborhood. He also served as vice president and managing director of CEDCO and CEDCO Financial Now Trump Fund, a national intermediary and CDFI respectively for over 13 years. He served as executive director of Westside Community Development at, in Tuscaloosa, a community development partnership with Stillman College. And today, um, Ivan is gonna talk about planning for a new community of innovators in Birmingham. And I'll let him take it from here. Ivan, Ivan Holloway. Thank you so much, Mr. Roddick. Thank you so much, Mr. T, for having me today. I'm excited to be here with you. So I hope that uh, something that I will say and present uh, will be uh, you know, stimulating to you and you can uh, use going forward um, in terms of just understanding a little bit more about Birmingham and uh, what uh, is on the horizon for Birmingham. So I'm going to go to a PowerPoint, if that's okay. And I hope you guys will be able to see my screen. Ivan, uh, if you could just mute everybody before you start. Okay. I think that would help. Yeah, thank you. Got it. Let's see here. Let me see. Yeah, I'm trying to get to the master control now. Uh, Phil, I might need for you to mute everybody. Uh, what about Phil? Phil, can you do it? It shows everybody is now muted, I believe so. Thank you so much, Phil. Okay. So again, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Roddick, for the introduction. Again, my name is Ivan Holloway, and I serve as executive director of an organization called urban impact and the work that we do is uh, centered around economic development and uh, equity and opportunity. We are a 501c3 nonprofit development organization uh, that does a number of programs but we generally uh, focus on economic development strategies, small business support services and um, those entities that uh, those programs that lend themselves to vibrancy and support. So right now we have roughly about four programs that we are, that we've really been pursuing as an organization. We're about a 40 year old organization. So we were started back in the 1980s. Uh, and the idea was that that was an area of downtown Birmingham that 
had uh, some cultural ties to uh, the African American community from the 1800s. And we wanted to figure out how we could preserve it. So uh, we created this organization called Urban Impact with the idea of um, historic preservation, business development, and support for um, uh, the growth of African American businesses in, in Birmingham. Uh, since that time, we've created a series of programs that support the work that we do. Uh, we are now a Main Street organization that's uh, a uh, organization that's designated by the state of Alabama through their Main Street program, which is connected to uh, a national network of Main Streets across the country. Uh, we also have a lending initiative with an international lending program called Kiva Services, uh, Kiva, uh, and it is a crowdfunding program that supports non-traditional businesses through micro-lending. Uh, we are a member of the Star Spark Network, which was started in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and that program, it allows us to provide business, uh, tailored business services uh, through a national platform utilizing the co-starters curriculum. Uh, and then uh, lastly, we host each year uh, a, um, a jazz festival that's been going on for 16 years. This will be the first year. We won't be doing it live. We'll actually be doing it uh, virtually. But uh, all of that leads to understanding uh, preservation and participating in helping our communities uh, understand diversity and those kinds of things through a series of programs. So today we're going to talk about uh, our work uh, as it relates to historic preservation and really the need for future development opportunities. So uh, I'll give you a little bit of history about uh, the district that uh, I work in and what um, what we hope to accomplish over the next few years. So in short, my organization, Urban Impact, uh, we believe that we create opportunities and impact for people, place, and business in Birmingham. So we have a small team and that team consists of four people. And uh, again, you heard uh, the introduction of me, an urban planner. I've been in uh, community and economic development for over 30 years now. And Dare Washington uh, serves as a director of programs, instrumental in bringing the Main Street program to uh, the uh, 4th Avenue District in downtown Birmingham and uh, Elijah Davis, who is our strategic growth manager, uh, graduated from UAB a few years ago and wanted to figure out how he could give back to his community. And I will tell you, if you work for a nonprofit, you're basically giving back to your community uh, because we don't pay a whole lot of salaries, but uh, we do have a passion for the work that we do and we're excited about doing work. Uh, and then there's uh, Ms. Carla Youngblood, a uh, graduate of Birmingham Southern. She is our Director of Compliance and she is a Certified Public Accountant. So we try to manage the resources that we have uh, in a most effective way so that we can continue to do the programs that we uh, have before us. So with that being said, um, let's see. Um, it looks like I'm managing, I'm sorry, my screen is stuck. Let's see. Okay, let's see. Let's see. Okay, so um, a little bit about the district. So uh, the district that we work in is roughly uh, an area of downtown Birmingham, just west of uh, the central portion of Birmingham. It's called much uh, uh, the Civil Rights District. The Civil Rights District really derived from many, 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 many years ago when 
uh, there was a division in the African American community and the majority community. Uh, Jim Crow line, which was traditionally 18th Street North. Uh, and so what happened because of that line, there was this indigenous group of uh, African American businesses, culture, and life that was developed uh, in the late 1800s uh, that went roughly through uh, the 1960s. And so what, um, what has happened is over that course of time, uh, a number of businesses uh, have grown and uh, a number of, of churches have uh, been placed and grown in that neighborhood. Uh, and more recently in uh, 2016, uh, the area was named a national monument, which is, which is um, the same as a national park uh, through, uh, the, uh, through President Obama. So uh, this area that we talk about, uh, it is um, roughly 18th Street to 15th Street and from 8th Avenue, which is now Abraham Woods, down to Second Avenue North. So it's about an 18 square block area uh, in downtown Birmingham. Uh, much of that community was constructed between 1893 and 1924. Uh, much of the district had uh, more than 300 African American businesses during that period of, uh, uh, at its height. And its height, like I said, really was between uh, 1922 and 1980, you had anywhere from uh, 300 businesses. For a location in downtown Birmingham, that's a pretty sizable number of African American businesses in one particular place. Much of the construction in that area was also done uh, by African Americans. And it was also the center of African-American architecture. And it is now uh, one of the highest concentrations of commercial property ownership by African-Americans, which again is uh, pretty remarkable uh, considering that most cities that have African-American communities, um, they're not located in downtown traditionally. They are, um, away from downtown and, and sort of separated. So Birmingham was unique in, in that sense. And from that, we have created a sense of place and a sense of opportunity. So just to give you a snippet of what it used to look like, this is a picture from the 1920s. Uh, and uh, you are looking west uh, down 4th Avenue and uh, you see, um, um, uh, you know, buildings and um, uh, you see the Masonic Temple in the, the far right uh, and a uh, church off to the uh, far right as, as well. But again, this particular community had much of the same thing as any other community. It had banks, it had drugstores, it had entertainment, uh, it had, uh, it, it had uh, housing. It had uh, everything that a um, progressive community would have. Uh, this particular community also had uh, about four banks uh, that were owned by African Americans. And that was probably one of the highest concentration of African American ownership of financial institutions during that period of time uh, anywhere in the country. Uh, and so this has. Uh, this has created an opportunity for us to really see uh, the past, but look at the future as a great, great opportunity. Uh, this particular building here is the uh, Masonic Temple. It was called the uh, Colored Masonic Temple uh, when it was erected. But this particular Masonic Temple uh, was uh, designed by the first African-American uh, uh, architect that was a credit from MIT. Uh, and it was designed in 1922 and construction was uh, completed in 1924. It is a seven-story building with a basement, uh, but again, 
think about the time that this was constructed when uh, it was very difficult for African Americans to amass property, African Americans to amass um, uh, resources uh, to construct a seven story building. Now, I will tell you that um, the, um, th this young man, Mr. Robert Robinson Taylor, who was uh, again and, and a graduate of uh, MIT, and uh, he worked at Tuskegee University in Tuskegee, Alabama. And he designed this building and many more buildings across the country uh, in a time when there really were no African-American architects. But I will tell you, this particular district is again unique uh, in its own, in its right, because not only do we have the first accredited uh, African-American architect, we have the second accredited uh, African-American architect uh, in the United States of America who has worked in this district as well. So you can begin to see the kind of people we were attracting to Birmingham to be a part of our community, to help uh, catapult our community uh, to, a, to a real national acclaim uh, and national level at a very, very early time uh, in the uh, development of the city of Birmingham. So again, just another look at um, um, Fourth Avenue looking west and the Masonic Temple in the background. But what you're looking at now, if you were standing there today, you would actually see the uh, Hugo Black Courthouse. That's what you would see in the background there now. So you would see the tail end of the, the courthouse and the remaining of the parking lot um, leading up to the, um, the uh, side of the Masonic Temple. So this is a picture of uh, 16th Street Baptist Church uh, in, the, uh, in the 1880s leading up to 1908. Uh, and what's uh, um, Unique about this is this was a um, sound structure, but um, its steeple was said to uh, be taller than the ordinance allowed. So the city of Birmingham ordered the uh, church to be torn down so that they could erect another church. And so they ended up erecting this church uh, which was again designed by the second accredited uh, African American architect, Mr. Rollis A. Rayfield, uh, who was uh, a local architect in Birmingham, who was also at Tuskegee University, who moved his practice to Birmingham uh, in the uh, early 1900s so that uh, he could grow his business. And uh, Mr. Rayfield did a number of uh, buildings and churches in Birmingham, as well as on college university campuses uh, across the Southeast, uh, and he even did some work uh, in the uh, Caribbean. So uh, this is, again, 16th Street Baptist Church. So you're beginning to see a theme, if you will, around uh, historical architecture, historical uh, buildings in their own right uh, that have really nothing to do at this point with civil rights, with anything like that. It is really around design, culture, and support for uh, the growth of a community. So uh, what we end up with is a, a map. So you probably can't see it, and uh, Mr. Teague or Mr. Roddick, if, uh, if you'd like me to uh, send the presentation over afterwards, I'd be glad to do that as, as well. Uh, but this is a map that is uh, from the uh, 1960s, and it really just shows uh, the, the divide of downtown Birmingham, but it also shows the proximity to everything uh, within uh, the downtown area. So the uh, blue dot represents the area where my office is located. Uh, the red dot represents uh, what you may know as the central business district where um, 
uh, Birmingham Green is, where uh, City Hall is, where um, uh, Regions Bank is, et cetera. And then uh, the, the, the Diamond, uh, which was the retail hub of the area is where uh, Pazit's um, department store used to be located uh, back, in the, uh, back in the early days. So just a little bit more about uh, the area in which we uh, work in. So, <clears throat> excuse me. So I, I talked a little bit about um, the area having as many as uh, four banks. One of those banks uh, continue to exist today. And that bank is Citizens Trust Bank. And Citizens Trust Bank was founded by Dr. A.G. Gaston, who had uh, a number of uh, business holdings uh, by the time of his death, uh, when he was well over 100 years old, when he passed, uh, he had, uh, he owned radio stations, funeral homes, construction companies, banks, insurance companies, um, et cetera, et cetera. But he was one of many who were a part of this particular community and who was instrumental in uh, our organization getting started and uh, making sure that um, there was a strategy in place by which we would continue to build uh, and preserve the history of this particular neighborhood. So uh, this area is part of the uh, Fountain Heights neighborhood in uh, Birmingham. And uh, as a part of a neighborhood, what has been lost over time has been the residential component in this particular part of downtown Birmingham. Uh, and so we see clearly opportunities for the rebirth of residential uh, and um, uh, the rebuilding of the, uh, the real fabric of what communities have uh, in this particular area. So again, uh, the organization is 40 years old. I've only been there four. So uh, I'm getting to know the organization, I'm getting to know the, the community, uh, and getting to know what goals the community wants to achieve. And so over that period of time, over that four year period of time, we've tried to uh, figure out a number of things. So we started a rebrand of the organization. We began to have uh, public discourse around uh, goals and ideas that the community wanted to embark upon and uh, which really led us to uh, a series of community discussions and meetings around, um, you know, what we believe this particular district can be. The naming of the National Monument really helped people see the national importance of this particular area. Uh, this is an area where, again, I talked about um, uh, culture, I talked about uh, architecture, and I talked about uh, a sense of place, but it is also a place where there were protests, there were bombings, there were um, uh, all kinds of uprisings around equality. Part of what we want to do in this area, based on what the community has said to us, is that uh, they want to make sure that we respect the past, but create new opportunities for the future. And so uh, our process began with a series of, of focus groups, business assessments, uh, and community conversations, trying to figure out where people were and uh, what their goals were for the community. Then we began to organize a series of, of meetings and, and get feedback. And then we moved to a series of activities that we believe could lead us to uh, a broader vision and more opportunities. So these are just a few of the um, um, uh, meetings that, that we had over time. But again, uh, what uh, folks said to us time and time again is they wanted us to revere and uh, refresh the unique culture of the district. Uh, they wanted us to uh, make sure that any development that 
we do is uh, beneficial to the uh, indigenous community and wanted us to make sure that there was more commercial space for lifestyle, uh, retail, and entertainment. And so that led us to more conversations with uh, partners and uh, stakeholders and friends uh, to really understand what was being done and what could be done. So back in 2018, leading into 2019, the city of Birmingham uh, started what was the Center City Master Plan. Uh, and the planning department, along with the um, um, the uh, other departments, mayor's office, started this master plan. And this was the city's. This is the city's, uh, you know, official strategy for moving forward. And uh, they had the final review in the fall of 2019, and it was finally adopted in early uh, 2020. There were a number of noted conditions that were highlighted in the city center master plan. And they really helped us concentrate our thinking, what folks had said to us uh, during our study, doing our focus groups and doing our research. So some of those conditions was that uh, the neighborhood and commercial district, you know, had really lost its fabric over time. But a lot of that had to do with both uh, what happened in the 60s, but more importantly, it was just around poor policy decisions that had been made and continued to be made. That this particular district, this particular area uh, has a, a disappointing view. So if you are uh, visiting, if you are uh, passing through, uh, there's nothing to see in the context of uh, understanding the layout and design. Then there was uh, a total lack of investment. Then again, uh, if you are a person like me that likes to walk, likes to jog and uh, just visit more areas, uh, it lacks an attractive and uh, safe pedestrian routes. And then uh, both the Civil Rights District as well as the Innovation District, which is just uh, south of um, our area, they were listed in this master plan as uh, catalytic areas, which means that it offers an opportunity uh, by its uh, name, by, its, by what could potentially happen there. So, we took a look at those noted conditions and began to talk to our partners and our stakeholders and said, you know, what can we do to really advance this conversation? What can we do to uh, galvanize the right people to help make a change, make a difference, uh, so that we have truly a representation uh, from both a physical and a visual standpoint for the city of Birmingham. Again, this is downtown Birmingham, right in the heart of the city. And we have people who come to Birmingham to visit 16th Street, to visit the National, um, the um, Civil Rights uh, Institute. Uh, I, I know at 16th Street, we have visitors who come from all over the world uh, annually. Uh, and uh, what we want to be able to have is not just uh, a, a view of one building or two buildings. We want to have a very enriched experience for people who visit Birmingham uh, and they take in the sites and they take in UAB. Uh, we want them to be in a nurturing environment where they understand what happened in Birmingham uh, was important, but where we are in Birmingham right now is important as well. And so uh, through that conversation, uh, the uh, group determined that there was a need to take it a step further from the city center master plan to a development plan. 
And so what we have embarked upon with a series of partners, Urban Impact leading the charge with Rev Birmingham, who a number of you may be familiar with, along with the city of Birmingham and Alabama Power. Uh, we came together and said, you know what, we can come up with a series of action steps, action items that we can deliver on. Uh, I know most of you know that the World Games will be in Birmingham in 2022. Uh, and we believe, again, if so many people will be joining us, we should be presenting you know, the best that we can present as Birmingham. So we came together to put together a action plan and it will be both uh, a uh, guide but it would also be a visual plan for folks to understand. The idea here is not to just have another plan, but to have, again, these action steps that organizations like Urban Impact and Rail Birmingham and others can actually participate in to make development happen over the course of time. Uh, now, it is admitted that it is doubtful that uh, we will have a fully developed area by 2022. But I believe that once we have this plan unveiled, we will be much further off uh, and much further along with development opportunities, bringing people to the table to understand what those potential opportunities are. So just a look at the entire area that we are focusing on. It is not just the civil rights area, but it is uh, the northwest quadrant of downtown Birmingham. So that area goes from 5920 uh, to 65 to Morris Avenue, which ultimately is the boundary of Railroad Park, and then again up 18th Street. So the idea is to have this broader area and this broader vision around development opportunities, investment, and engagement. This area also includes the switch area, which some of you may know as the innovation district. And in the heart of the innovation district is uh, the innovation depot. Uh, and of course, innovation depot is again, a, a big partnership with uh, University of Alabama at Birmingham and a series of others. So the idea is how do we grow opportunities uh, for further development uh, throughout this district? So um, some of you may have noted the title was creating, you know, um, a plan for new innovators for Birmingham. And again, uh, innovation around development, innovation around business, uh, and innovation around entrepreneurship. That's what this is all about. And it is about recreating uh, this fabric of opportunity which Birmingham is known for. It's not called the Magic City for nothing. Uh, so we plan to really put that to the test in this uh, planning strategy. So uh, just a couple of things uh, to, to let you know that we are in fact moving. So uh, in uh, September of 2019, we worked and solidified a series of developers to redevelop the uh, Masonic Temple. So that uh, development will be coming online uh, in the uh, late uh, 2020. Uh, it probably is a little bit behind because of COVID, but we anticipate uh, getting started at least by late 2020. Uh, and that will be a historic property development, which will, um, which will uh, preserve and protect the historical integrity of that particular building, both uh, in, in name, but more importantly, in architecture and features. Uh, in um, Again, in, in November, we really launched our whole partnership with Rev Birmingham, the city of Birmingham and Alabama Power around this, this whole concept of a development plan. 
which led us to issue an RFP for consulting services. Uh, we're really looking for a national firm to help work with us to develop this plan. And this national firm would be uh, planners and designers who understand uh, the kind of work around preservation, the kind of work around development opportunities, and the kind of work around uh, historical culture and context. We went through a process and we probably received uh, about nine applications from across the country and finally narrowed that down to um, about four in uh, February, went through the process of interviewing those four and we finally selected uh, a firm uh, that was partnered with a local firm in Birmingham. So this firm is called MKSK, who's partnered with CCR Architecture here in Birmingham, and they were selected to be the planners of record for this particular uh, endeavor. And so they got started in July, so we're excited about the work that they are doing. Uh, they have uh, really been doing a lot of community engagement, again, just trying to get a feel for what the community's ideas are. So if there's anybody who want to be interviewed by the planners uh, to uh, be a part of this study, we'd love to have you. And I will make sure that you have my email address so that you can, again, reach out to me so we can get you on the contact list. Uh, but so we're now in September. The expectation is by the end of September going into uh, early October, that we will get some kind of report back from the planners letting us know that uh, the assessment uh, team has been doing well with interviews, with the uh, collection of data from, from technical resources like the Regional Planning Commission, the City of Birmingham, and a series of other partners around what strategies are already in place and what strategies need to be in place for this to be a real uh, codified development area. And so the expectation is by the time we get to uh, December and uh, early January of 2021, we will have a plan in place that we can present to the community for their buy-in and support that uh, charts a specific course for this particular area around uh, development, business development, investment, and the whole nine yards. The, so this is the, uh, just a little picture of the team that we selected, Mr. Roman Gary uh, of CCR, Ms. Tammy Cohen of CCR, Ms. John Castile of uh, Greenville, Mr. Brian McCarry, uh, he's out of the Midwest, uh, Mr. Brian Overbeck, and uh, the principal in charge is Mr. Darren Myers. So we have a good group of uh, dedicated architects and planners who will help shape our vision. Won't be their vision, it will be our vision. And that's why we want everybody to participate uh, in this process so that they can take your ideas, our ideas, and uh, put them to paper and really just uh, um, make sure that there's a visual and textual uh, context by which uh, we are moving forward with the uh, development of this particular district. So people like me, I'm very excited. Uh, you know, as a planner, these are the kinds of things that we live for and uh, to be a part of changing the dynamics of this community that will hopefully last for years to come is um, brings a great deal of excitement and um, joy to, to, to me and the work that, that I do. So again, we started uh, in late June, early July, and the goals are really set around uh, what um, came out of our community conversations that we've been having over the last two years. And so we want to build on local strengths. And we find that, uh, again, community assets and opportunities are very strong. We want to build for people. We don't want to just build for the sake of building. We want to build for people who can utilize the 
infrastructure that we put in place, that there is an opportunity for everyone to participate uh, in the economic growth and future growth of the city of Birmingham. And then lastly, uh, we want to build long-term value. So again, we don't want to just build something for today. We want to build something for tomorrow that uh, continues to grow our economy and have value in uh, our, our community. So a uh, few objectives of the master development plan. Uh, again, set a vision that really holds the values of both the civil rights district and the innovation district around entrepreneurship, around growth, and around opportunity. Uh, we want to make sure that we're providing, again, that next level of detail, understanding, and analysis so that uh, it's not just a shelf plan, but it is an action plan. Uh, we want to provide uh, a series of recommendations that lead to a very inclusive process. So again, uh, unfortunately, COVID has hampered us um, somewhat, but we're gonna be using the Zoom format. We're gonna be using uh, a series of, of phone interviews and phone banking so that we still touch as many people as we possibly can. So uh, I am excited to be here with you today because uh, this is, uh, my interview, if you will, uh, for many of these that I have to do in the upcoming weeks with the series of stakeholders and uh, investors. So um, I hope this goes extremely well. But uh, the idea is to create an implementation strategy around action steps that we can take as a community, as investors, to make sure that things happen in, uh, um, again, a, a, a format by which the community has bought into. And then what are those projects that are in the public realm? How can they be tackled uh, given uh, public costs and um, the associated uh, efforts to support planning there? And then the, um, this particular plan will really show you know, what the long range development and infrastructure needs are that we can begin implementing over time. Again, we're not expected to get there overnight, but if we have a strategy by which different projects are to come online and take place over time, then we'll eventually fulfill the efforts of this particular development strategy. So, um, there are a couple of components within the, um, this master development plan that we want to make sure that we identify, uh, that align with uh, our objectives. And it's, again, making sure that it is inclusive of the community, that as many voices that want to be heard uh, can be heard. Uh, it is making sure that we have the right market data that supports development. Just because I have a great idea doesn't mean anything. There has to be substantial market data to support uh, the various development opportunities. So we want to make sure that we provide some of that market data up front. So as you begin to look at projects that you want to invest in, a lot of that market data is already in place for you. Uh, it will also identify a series of uh, corridor studies or corridor plans. Of course, 16th Street, 16th Street is, uh, in my opinion, considered the spine of this particular area. It runs from uh, what is uh, 8th Avenue, now called Abraham Woods, uh, down to really uh, Morris Avenue, where it ends at um, the, um, um, the Birmingham uh, Max Bus uh, Terminal. And so it goes, again, through the Civil Rights District down through the uh, Switch Innovation District. So it connects the two areas together. So I can imagine just a wonderful walkable uh, uh, trail uh, up and down that area with uh, a number of sites, public art, 
and those kinds of things. So we want to make sure that we have key strategies that focus on these key areas. So 16th Street, 4th Avenue, 2nd Avenue North, and 14th Streets uh, are uh, a number of those um, corridor focused plans. Also, we want to make sure that we are connected to adjacent neighborhoods. We want to make sure that there is access, that there is um, a reason for neighborhoods to want to be there. We want to make sure that neighborhood residents have something else that they can put on their to-do list. Uh, and to be in an area that is walkable, that is accessible, that, uh, is, uh, that has a number of placemaking activities for people to want to be involved. Uh, again, uh, there are probably um, three public parks in this area. There is uh, a trail. We want to make sure that they're connected in a way that makes sense that people can actually take advantage of uh, the public resources that are out there. And that, uh, again, they're walkable, they have uh, visual aesthetics associated with it, and that uh, it adds to the value of being a, a citizen of Birmingham. Then again, focusing on those development sites that can happen quickly and can uh, have impact over time. Meaning that if you invest in this building, somebody else is likely to invest in another development. And that's what we want to be able to see. We want to capture the architectural themes, making sure that uh, if there is an opportunity to preserve a certain character and a certain look, that we can do that uh, by making sure that there are the proper um, guidelines and policy that helps to make those things happen. Uh, in most urban cities, parking is always a challenge. So we want to make sure that we're looking at parking and we don't leave parking to chance, that it is built in a way that supports the uh, activity and growth of this particular uh, community. And then uh, gateway enhancements, again, a, looking at those corridor studies and then determining what kind of gateway enhancements need to be done so that we again create this visual effect for the uh, visitor to the area. And then lastly, uh, an opportunity for um, somehow this has got to be paid for, it's got to be managed, and we don't want to put everything on local government so we want to make sure that there are structures in place, uh, there are strategies in place that lead to long-term sustainability. Uh, it's nothing like having uh, something invested in uh, and over time uh, there's not a sustainability strategy and you, you ride by, you visit it, and you say, I wonder what happened. Uh, so we don't want to have that look and that feel. We want it to be top-notch and top-class the entire time. And so that's pretty much the elements of the development plan. So uh, just to leave you with some visuals, uh, because um, we want to make sure that uh, we build off, again, the history that's there, uh, creating an environment that is inviting to all and uh, making sure that there is opportunity for all to participate in uh, the uh, rebirth of this particular area of downtown Birmingham. So uh, that ends my formal presentation. Uh, again, my name is Ivan Holloway and I'm representing Urban Impact and a partner in this uh, program is Rev Birmingham and that is led by Mr. David Fleming who is the uh, president and CEO there. And so if, uh, again, if you have uh, any questions, want to get involved, by all means, you can email me or email David, and uh, we would uh, be excited to uh, get you guys involved. So if there are questions, I'll take questions. If not, I will uh, turn it back over to you guys. Uh, Ivan? <clears throat> Yes, Ivan, this is Larry. Uh, I've got two questions for yes, you. Sir. One, one is, what is the origin of the name Switch for that neighborhood that you've got labeled as Switch? 
how did that come about and what did it mean? And secondly, you mentioned earlier that uh, originally there were uh, there was neighborhoods, there was residential uh, sections that kind of got lost over the years. Uh, is there in this plan a, a, a move to reintroduce those or is it going to be more of a business art type of, of, of approach uh, to that? So uh, I'll start with the first one. So um, the, uh, the switch district is, um, and I, I will tell you what I know, uh, the switch district is really being managed by Rev Birmingham and David Fleming. But uh, based on our conversations that we've had, uh, it uh, has a lot to do with that particular area having a huge uh, switch area. Uh, it was, as, as some of you may know, Birmingham was a big railroad town uh, at one particular time. And uh, that particular area uh, houses um, uh, one of the early switches uh, for Birmingham. And uh, it was a, a series of docks. And what they have done is taken the term switch uh, and really put it in a context of opportunity, growth, uh, and uh, development. But the derivation is really around that particular uh, rail line being there. Yeah. The, uh, the second um, uh, response is uh, yes. Uh, we hope to introduce uh, the appropriate housing through this particular plan. I think that part of uh, what we talked about, what I talked about a minute ago in terms of being able to provide market data that supports development opportunities, that's the first phase, being able to make sure that uh, the market will support a variety of types of housing opportunities. And once we have that data back, uh, which we believe we will have, we will certainly look to cultivate uh, uh, both single family and multifamily uh, in this particular area. Again, we don't want this just to be a tourist destination. We want it to be, again, a livable community uh, by which uh, folks can be a part of the excitement on a daily basis and uh, not only be um, um, participants uh, in the community, but also be um, uh, recipients of the economic impact of the growth of this particular district. So uh, in short, yes, we do expect housing to be a part of this. Do you have uh, any idea about what percentage of your income or success will depend on the population within a five mile distance from your from your district versus uh, tourists versus people from beyond five mile so um so we don't have the local numbers yet and that's what this market study will actually do for us but i can tell you that uh the places where they have urban national monuments they say that it typically has about a um 300 million dollar impact uh, once the monument is up and running. Uh, and so the monument in Atlanta has probably about that number, and we expect our numbers to be somewhere with that for viewership. The one thing that I'm told from the National Park Service is that once you put up the, um, the arrowhead that actually says that you are a national park, uh, the expectation is for uh, people to come from all over the United States seeking to have their national park passport stamped. And they tell me that that number is uh, a very, very, very large number. So going forward, though, I, I, I hope to have the uh, local impact that you asked about from our uh, consultants that we expect to generate locally. Dr. Holloway, you mentioned the Birmingham Jazz Hall of Fame, or at least the Jazz Festival. I assume that's yes. being done at the Carver Theater, right? 
what what is the status with the theater and the Jazz Hall of Fame? I, I haven't, I've been there in the years past. It's been a while. Uh, could you tell us a little more about that? Absolutely. That's, that's a very good question. Um, so the uh, Alabama Jazz Hall of Fame uh, and the, um, the uh, Carver Performing Arts, uh, they are one and the same. And uh, the uh, facility is owned by the city of Birmingham and it is managed by the uh, board of directors of the Alabama Jazz Hall of Fame. Uh, they finally um, started construction uh, a few months ago and uh, it is, um, uh, it will be a very modern facility once it is uh, completed. I think um, the estimated uh, completion time is um, uh, late fall of 2021 and uh, but it will be both a performing arts the, uh, theater uh, as well as it will be able to uh, show feature films as as well it will also hold the um, uh, the African American uh, Radio uh, Museum, and so it will have a a dual uh, a mini role uh, kind of uh, a status. But yes, it is underway, and uh, it will be a fabulous theater to join the uh, Lyric and the uh, Alabama Theater in in that area. And I think we'll all be extremely proud of it. Uh, speaking of development, the A.G. Gaston Motel is also under uh, development as well. It is in two parts. Uh, the National Park Service uh, is, is uh, the uh, owner of one side of it, and that's truly what makes up the National Monument. Uh, and then the uh, east side of the building is still owned by the city of Birmingham, other than an easement that the National Park Service has. So the National Park Service uh, side is under construction. That project is moving forward. And uh, we expect that one to come online in uh, 2021 as well. The uh, National Park Service has named a superintendent to uh, the National Park. Uh, his name is Mr. Christopher Butcher, uh, who both manages uh, the Birmingham site as well as the Anderson site. And these are all recent developments. So we are extremely excited about uh, Mr. Butcher coming on board and being a part of this. And uh, I think, again, as we begin to really build out this plan, it's really gonna connect all of the sites and activities together in a way that they've not been connected before. Does the creation of this national park uh, area in any way negate or create problems for commercial and residential development in the area? Because they're usually pretty sticky about things like that. And then the other question I have is, is do you envision this as being largely a African-American community or it will, will it be mixed like the, presumably the rest of the city's development? Both awesome questions. Yes, sir. So um, the, the, the first question is, so on the surface, uh, the way that uh, the legislation reads, uh, it won't have um, a lot of effect on the commercial property owners and development opportunities. Uh, but again, I use the word on the surface, right? Uh, there is another effort uh, for this particular area to become a world heritage area. Uh, and uh, the world heritage area has a uh, much stricter requirement and expectation than the National Park Service. So um, the national, uh, the World Heritage designation is, um, is designated by um, a group called UNESCO, which is... Um, United which, Nations. Correct, and that's absolutely correct. Uh, United Nations, which is, uh, and they have sites all over the world. So the, uh, the, uh, the process to become 
uh, a World Heritage Site is a little bit more leaner in terms of what the expectations are, right? So uh, there could be uh, some um, restrictions associated uh, there as uh, the area seeks that designation, but not from a national park uh, standpoint. The, uh, the second part, um, my hope is that, again, that this particular area is a part of Birmingham and that everybody gets an opportunity to participate and be a part of it. Uh, the, what I will say is I think what we would uh, like to um, achieve is, um, is a balance of understanding of architecture, a balance of understanding history, a balance of understanding um, and reverence to uh, what the area has been over time. And I think that uh, that is the balance that I am seeking as uh, an urban planner, uh, as a citizen, as a member of 16th Street, uh, and as a, um, um, a guy that grew up in Birmingham, that uh, we all have an opportunity to participate and be a part of what I believe is still a dynamic community and dynamic city. So I hope that answers your question. Are there any other questions? All right, if there are not, I, Dr. Holloway, we've certainly, it's been a pleasure to have you give your presentation. I've learned something here about a city that I grew up in, by the way. Great. Uh, and uh, it's good to see all of you. And we will be back next week on Wednesday and Thursday. Mm -hmm. And we will have, once again, our curriculum meeting on Tuesday, which I'll send out a, a notice on. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Larry, for giving that introduction. Thank you once again, Dr. Holloway. And just call me Ivan. Thank you. Right. Right. Thank you so much. Thank you all for having me. I enjoyed it so much. And I look forward to seeing you somewhere sometime again in the future. Okay. Great. Thanks, Thanks a lot. All right. Well, let me, Phil, let me get in just a brief reminder. We will be, uh, Friday Forum will be convening uh, tomorrow at 930. Uh, if there's anyone that did not get an invitation, they went out Wednesday for the uh, Friday Forum session. Uh, drop me an email at 1dblong at gmail.com and we'll get one to you and put you on the list. Huh? Yeah, I'm sorry, uh, Don, I neglected to mention that. I'm glad that you said something. I really will not in the future forget Friday Forum, which of course I, I attend. So thanks again. Great. We'll see you tomorrow, Phil. All right. Good.